Uh, thanks for coming to uh, Working Together to Improve Security Visibility in Kubernetes. My name is Jeremy Rickard. I'm a co-chair of SIG Release uh, and an engineer at Microsoft. Uh, my, my name is Rita. I am part of the Kubernetes Security Response Committee, also SIG Auth, also Microsoft. All right. Um, so. Thank you for being here on a Friday. Uh, I know it's been a really long conference, but thank you for being here. And you must really care about security if you're in this talk. So I just want to thank everybody. Um, but also the most important thing that you probably could get out of this talk is if you see a security problem, please, please, please work with us and don't disclose it publicly. Right? The reason why we have a security response committee um, and a bunch of really nice SIG maintainers uh, a project maintainers is we want to work with you to address these uh, vulnerabilities privately, right? And make sure we can get all of them patched before the bad guys get to them. So if there's anything you take out of this session is please report it in with those um, emails as well as um, the website uh, if you want to also get bounties for them. Okay, so we're going to start off by talking about how SIGs work together to help achieve security for the project and, and provide visibility into that. Whenever a vulnerability is disclosed, the SRC is gonna work with a bunch of other SIGs to help fix those things. SIG release will help cut releases. SIG security is gonna help with some tooling to help visualize some of those things. So we're gonna dive into each one of these areas and figure out exactly what they do. Oh, I cannot see. Um, yeah, okay, sorry. All right, first off, um, let's just talk about a few of the uh, SIGs and committees that are formed uh, within the project to specifically address CVEs. Um, so first we start with SRC, Security Response Committee. It's a committee, it's not a SIG. It is responsible for triaging and fixed coordinations. Uh, and it, it is also responsible for disclosing the security issues in Kubernetes. Uh, the, the SRC, the Kubernetes SRC is a CNA, uh, which stands for CVE Naming Authority. Uh, it basically authorizes these uh, folks to actually issue a CVE and report it to uh, the, the National Vulnerability Database. Um, currently, we have eight representatives from various companies uh, and with diverse experience in Kubernetes. Um, and our job is, uh, again, ensuring that um, there are uh, different areas of Kubernetes and the ecosystems on top of Kubernetes are well represented, right? And we also want to make sure um, that different severity ratings are taken into consideration because there are various ways you can deploy Kubernetes, right? Uh, and again, it may, maybe some CVs may not be important for one company, but it may be important for other companies or other distributors or other way of running Kubernetes. Uh, and last but not least, um, we're always looking for people who may have experience in Kubernetes and want to actually join us uh, and help with the, the, the CVEs uh, that we have to triage. Oh, go ahead, you can click. Yeah. Okay, next up, uh, SIG release. Who has ever downloaded a container image from registry.case.io? All right, everybody. So SIG release is responsible for the mechanics of cutting the release. There are two sub-projects. One is the release team. You've probably seen a lot of uh, calls for participation in the release team as a shadow, the release blogs, all kinds of good information about that. The second project is the release engineering sub-team. That subteam is responsible for developing tools like CREL, which is the Kubernetes release toolbox, and maintaining the um, cloud build jobs, the other tooling that helps actually do those releases. So once a release is done, say like 131 is released soon. 132. 132 is released soon, I can't count, it's Friday. Um, they work with release engineering to, to do the, the RC, the alpha, the actual .0 cut, and then things move over to the release engineering team to help maintain the branches and keep things healthy until the end of support. Uh, and next, I want to talk a little bit about SIG auth. Um, so this is a uh, SIG that spe spe specifically looks at uh, protecting access and control of Kubernetes APIs. 
Uh, specifically, you know, uh, authentication, authorization are, are part of it as well. Um, and also the SIG looks at auditing as well as security policies. Uh, and then it's also um, also has sub projects within the uh, within the SIG off space, and they often get uh, consulted on uh, issues that that um, uh, people report on. Okay, next up we have SIG Security. SIG Security is a interesting SIG. They don't own specific features inside of Kubernetes, but they handle things like regular security audits. Um, they helped build this thing called the official CVE feed, which is a great place where you can go and see all the CVEs as they, as they happen and are released. Uh, and they work on cross-cutting security documentation and working across the SIGs to help maintain uh, the community's security posture. Uh, so let's maybe talk about what, what is a life in a CVE, a Kubernetes CVE? What is the actual life cycle? Say if you are a security researcher and you want to report a CVE, what does that actually look like and how does it actually eventually get to um, the actual release as well as your favorite scanner, right? Um, so first it starts with you. maybe you uh, send an email to SRC or maybe you open up an uh, issue, a, open a case on HackerOne. Um, so Kubernetes also uh, has funds a HackerOne, uh, sorry, Kubernetes is a HackerOne project. So you can actually uh, report a CV, uh, report a security issue there. And then uh, someone like myself uh, and Joe in the audience will actually be triaging those issues. Um, and so for, for SRC, we actually have on-call. So every one of us in periodically will we'll get on uh, on-call where we actually assess the legitimacy of these issues. Sometimes these are um, issues that has nothing to do with Kubernetes. Uh, maybe like, hey, you have, look at this Kubernetes this project and the subdomain may be taken over. Something uh, like those. Uh, which again, we appreciate the reporting, but obviously it's not uh, something that actually impacts the project, right? Um, so again, when, once the issue is actually, le if we decide the issue is legitimate, we actually work with the SIG leads uh, and the project maintainers to create the patch, right? And actually issues the CVEs. Um, and if it impacts core Kubernetes, this is where we work with Kate's release uh, team and get the fix into uh, a patch release or and the main branch, right? So that we make sure the next patch release includes this CVE patch. Uh, and also very, very important is if you are a Kubernetes distributor and you are involved with the Kubernetes project, we highly, highly recommend that you add yourself to the private um, disclosure mailing list. This is where we give our distributor friends uh, usually two, three weeks ahead of time notice so that they can actively uh, figure out how to patch their environments uh, for themselves as well as, as, well as for their customers uh, before the CV becomes public, right? Uh, this is really, really important because on, you know, when the issue, is, sorry, when the CV is public, we want to make sure, you know, bad actors can't get to people's clusters and do bad things, right? Uh, so then we, again, on embargo, uh, um, pub public day, uh, we, we actually disclose it, uh, and then we work with the um, SIG release to get it out, uh, and then once the issue is created in the GitHub repo, it's public, and this is also where we push the um, CV details to uh, the MVD database um, uh, and describe what are the components that are impacted, and then the same information then lands on the official feed. Mm -hmm. So why don't we take a look at how, what that actually looks like? Let's give that a shot. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna do some experimentation here and switch to another window. And hopefully, things still work. And these links will be in the deck as well, so you can click around later. <laughs> All right, so what we've got here, uh, let's go back to one more tab. <laughs> to here. Okay, so uh, Rita mentioned that uh, when it's time for the CV to be um, announced and, and released, the first thing that happens as part of that process is obviously a fix is done. That happens while the embargo is in place and it's distributed to the distributors. 
once it's ready to be released, then we start the process of um, creating issues. Uh, we can see some here. This is the Kubernetes Kubernetes repo, and you can see issues tagged with official CVE feed. That happens after we've merged the patches into the branches that are affected, and the release process has begun. The second piece of this puzzle, go here, is the official CVE feed. So this is driven by that data in the GitHub repo. So in KK, those issues that are labeled with that, that label will be used uh, in an automated fashion to produce this feed. And it's pretty cool. You can come through here and you can see, uh, oops, you can see the CVE number, you can see description, um, links to the PRs, uh, all kinds of really, really good information uh, to help you understand if you're gonna be impacted by this or not. Uh, here is an example of a CVE that we released in 2020, I mean, we didn't release it, but we published it in 2024, and we worked with SIG Windows to get the uh, specific patch out, um, and this is the public issue. Yep, same information you can see in there, all good stuff. Okay, so how do we uh, get things into the release notes, and how do we start the process of getting all of the data out to where it needs to go? Well, the first thing that happens, obviously, is the patches are gonna land, but as that process is happening, we uh, have a tool in Krell that I mentioned earlier that will generate release notes for a given release. You've probably seen that before. Lists all the cool new features and bug fixes that have happened. One of the other things that will land in there is the list of CVEs that are being fixed. And this is a YAML file that gets injected into a Google Cloud Storage bucket that gets consumed as part of the actual release. So as we're generating the release notes after a release has been done, uh, it will look for a file like this that has metadata about all of the different branches impacted. So we've got 130 here, 129. Um, a lot of similar data, but this is crafted by somebody from the SRC as they're going through that process of uh, telling us which mm -hmm. things need to be fixed. That again lands in the release notes. Obviously you can find those here. And then, SRC uh, moves yep. into? This is the same information we then publish to the MVD database. Um, you might ask, why do you share these details? Well, I bet you've gotten false positives from your favorite scanners. Um, and this is why we try to be as detailed as possible so that in the, in the event the component that you're using is not impacted or the version you're using is not impacted, you don't have to deal with them. And for people who are on the receiving end, they love this. <laughs> That data all goes to NIST, right? Right. And then what happens with that data? Uh, then the scanners will actually, wait, we have a slide later about yeah. how the scanners actually talk to or leverage those uh, security vulnerability databases. Also to GitHub? Oh, yeah, and GitHub um, security action, sorry, GitHub security database um, also leverages the same database and actually cross correlates. Uh, like this one actually is a, it identifies this particular vulnerability as a Go vulnerability. So if you have, for example, if you are using certain Kubernetes APIs in your code, it will actually uh, uh, flag it, or if you're using Go vulner uh, Go vuln check, it will actually flag it. Uh, and there's a bunch of pieces of data there. Is that all auto-generated right now, or do we have to do individual pieces? Uh, for the things that we submit, um, obviously we try to automate, but there's a lot of human stuff in there. Um, but I think in terms of this, I think someone in GitHub does this. Right, that's wild. The reality is the process has a lot of manual steps. A somebody lot. has to upload and that. Some human is the pushing buttons. To the GCS bucket, somebody has to craft the YAML. Uh, one of the things we want to do going forward is to look at streamlining this process. So maybe there's a single source of truth that can be used to generate the rest of those artifacts along the way. We haven't started that yet, but it's something we're definitely going to prioritize into the new year, just because it's, it's a little difficult. Okay, back to our slides. Okay, oh, tell so, us about the HackerOne bug bounty. Yeah, uh, so because Kubernetes is funding a HackerOne uh, bounty program, uh, we want to be very uh, careful in terms of um, letting our reporters understand, hey, these are ways where you can get money, right, for reporting these uh, vulnerabilities. And, and I think we've done a pretty good job of funding it, uh, the CNCF is funding it, 
Um, and w because of that, I think there's a lot, of, a lot more incentives for security researchers to go uh, discover things that we can go patch, right? Um, so you may ask, what's in scope? Um, currently, uh, pretty much everything under the Kubernetes org uh, and also Kubernetes SIG, uh, special, uh, you know, subgroup projects are actually under um, the Kubernetes uh, Hacker One program. Uh, however, elig eligibility-wise, obviously, if you're a SIG maintainer, you are an SRC member, you're not going to get, you know, you're out of that. Um, but having said that, even if you don't get the bounty, but you see problems, please, please, please report them. Um, you know, I'm sure that everyone else in the community will really, really appreciate it. All right, um, one thing, uh, you know, this talk is also about what are we planning to do in the future. Um, so one thing we are revisiting is, does it make sense for SRC and the bounty program to cover everything? And I don't know when was the last time you looked at uh, how many repos are there in K6? There's like 140 or something like that, pretty crazy. Um, so we may need to also revisit the scope of the program uh, to ensure we, prioritize the ones that are actually being used in production, and that also very, very important is to make sure that the sub-projects and the maintainers actually go through some vetting process to let users know, hey, just because I'm a project under Kubernetes or Kubernetes 6 org, there are some graduation pro process that actually signals to the user, hey, this thing can be used for production, and there are people behind the project that can handle CVE um, reports, so, which we think is really, really important. Uh, and then I think, uh, so yeah, so we're proposing a process for uh, SIG maintainers to opt in, uh, and again, the, the goal is to provide better visibility to end users. Uh, okay, just really briefly, um, you know, you can definitely check out the HackerOne Kubernetes page to see more details, but the general core um, TLDR here is KK core, you know, any core dependency, you know, like K-log or um, source code modification, any bypassing uh, of like community review process or, you know, infrastructure uh, type of thing, those are basically tier one in terms of getting uh, the bounty. Uh, and, you know, anything that touches, um, you know, say, impacting our release artifacts or actually you running your Kubernetes clusters, say, in the API server, those are definitely high, high, high priority-wise. Um, and this is also where we look at the, um, depending on, you know, is it beta, you know, GA or alpha, this also determines uh, the bounty that you, you are qualified for. Uh, and then, again, there are other tiers, uh, and as you can see, the GA beta features are uh, quite a bit of a criteria, um, and then also, you know, is this entry Kubernetes or is this a sub-project, right? Uh, again, there's way more details on the website. Okay, Rita, do we issue bug bounties for dependency bumps? No. Okay. So, patch releases are, um, Something that is an important thing to realize, when we make them, and any change that goes into them can have a lot of impact, right? We wanna make patch releases easy to consume, and we wanna make the security fixes easy to consume without bringing a lot of extra stuff along with them. So if you look at the cherry pick guidelines today, they're pretty strict, and we actually just made them a little bit more explicit about what qualifies for a backport and what doesn't. TLDR, Unless it's a security fix, we're gonna be really, really strict about backporting things. Dependency updates that will just silence Trivi or Gripe or Twist Lock or whatever, um, those are generally not gonna be something that we will take back. And the reason for that is every time we cherry pick something back to a previous branch, we run the risk of adding a regression. So Jordan Liggett has done some really great analysis on regression over time. There's a spreadsheet, uh, we'll have a link for it, but there's a lot of data in here, and you can see the trend is not super great for some releases. Uh, 119 ended up with 33 regressions by the time it was out of support. 33 times code was backported that introduced new bugs, new breaking behaviors. 
So we want to work on enhancing that, that criteria about what we take back. And, and scanners are definitely going to continue reporting those dependency pieces. And, and the really interesting thing is that sometimes those aren't even called, but they're just found by the scanners. Yeah. So tell us how the scanners work. Yes, uh, I know we are all bugged by, bugged by scanners, um, but I, I mean, at least before I worked with Jeremy on all this, I actually didn't understand how scanners worked, right? Um, so I just wanna briefly uh, kind of um, talk about that. Um, so there are many types of scanners. Um, specifically, there's static code anal analyzers, you know, obviously container image scanners, runtime detectors, right? So you mentioned Trivi, Falco, uh, go, go bone check, many, many, right? And specifically, here we're talking, a lot of times we're talking about container image scanning, right? Now, when these scanners actually inspects the, the image, what it does is it looks for OS packages, libraries, in all the different layers of the image. And it actually correlates with specific Kubernetes components, like API server, kubelet, whatnot, and it will show the impact and the fixed version uh, as part of the, the output of the scanner. Um, and earlier, as I mentioned, um, many of the scanners actually uh, gets their data from many of these vulnerability databases. Um, these are just some, but not all. Uh, very importantly, this is why we push our CV data to NVD and obviously GitHub security advisories. Um, and then also Oval. A lot of people don't know that um, a lot of vendors push uh, structured data for th their vulnerabilities um, to the oval to their oval database because they're authorized to publish that information. Uh, and again, what we like about the oval database is because it provides more um, accurate and re reduce the false positives. Uh, and obviously, there's also OS specific um, security databases. Uh, and so, what the scanners uh, do they they basically correlate all that data from different uh, databases and and produce the lovely results that you all get for your, for your daily scanning. Uh, and last but not least, recommended practice, right, is um, if you are running your own Kubernetes components or CNCF components, we highly, highly recommend that. Pick your favorite scanner, or maybe scanners, depending on your use cases. Um, run, make sure you have continuous running, uh, continuous scanning on your CI/CD pipeline. Uh, make sure you get up-to-date scanner, scanner signatures and rules to make sure you get the latest from these databases. Um, but also think about publishing your own uh, OS packages and publishing your own CV data to the databases that, that I just talked about. I'm pretty sure you've thought about this, like I'm pretty sure this is a false positive, but how can I tell the scanners to not do that? Um, so those are kind of things that we do uh, at Microsoft as well. All right, so apologies if uh, whoever I replied to here is in the room, but uh, oftentimes we get issues like this asking us to bump dependencies uh, or bump Go versions because things are showing up as vulnerable by Trivi, for example. We often reply and say this. Uh, so what can we do to help people have more visibility into the, the actual state of what's going on? I, I love how he just walked in. The, the, guy, the guy on the issue. Oh, perfect. Ite. Nice to see you. So um, in addition to what uh, Rita mentioned in terms of Oval, there are some changes and some new things happening in the, in the ecosystem around VEX or vulnerability exchange. There's a few different formats uh, that are coalescing, but what they allow you to do is to you know, disclose vulnerabilities, but also to disclose things that are not vulnerabilities or things that have been fixed. You get a little bit more control over how that data is represented. We have a, a great reply from Atai here uh, talking about how Trivi supports OpenVex documents. Um, a number of scanners are starting to look at that uh, as a, another way to enhance the, the picture of your, your vulnerabilities. So we have been considering, I didn't include the reply here, but we have been considering that for a little bit. Can we start to produce VEX documents for the Kubernetes releases. This is kind of outside of the scope of the SRC, obviously, because they're not real dependency or real vulnerabilities. Sometimes they are, we do bump those things, and we can report that as well. But 
uh, this is another piece of data that we can provide as part of this process. So there's a couple of different issues here. So, um, first is to just generally set up a VEX document that's available. And the second one's more specifically about the implementation. One way we can do this with Go in a fairly automated manner is to use Go Volncheck. It's another tool uh, that does a little bit deeper analysis to look at how functions are actually called and how libraries are used to better understand how uh, vulnerabilities in a dependency that you might have actually might impact your code. So let's take a look at what that might look like. So here is an example of a statement uh, in open VEX format regarding a Go um, vulnerability. So it's CVE 2024-34156. And you can see the status is reported as not affected and the justification is vulnerable code not present. So the code in the Kubernetes code base that might call this library in a way that is um, something that would cause the exploit to be uh, present isn't found when it does the analysis of the code paths. Uh, so Go Volncheck will do this automatic, auto, automatically for us as an output. Um, it's pretty cool. There are some rough edges we have found through our testing, some, some false positives, some false negatives. Uh, it uses the, the Go Voln database, uh, Go Voln DB, um, to have a lot of this information. They're pretty good about updating it, so we've been able to uh, submit some, some issues and have things corrected, but uh, one thing that's kind of interesting here is the ID. So we have uh, package OCI kubectl uh, with the digest that goes along with that. This isn't generated by Go Volncheck right now because it's, it's analyzing the code. It doesn't have a good way to map to what container image we're looking at or what release we're looking at. But Trivi needs this. So we have some proof of concept post-processing of this to generate uh, that, that wrapper. Or not really wrapper, that linkage. Here's an example of one that is affected. So you see it's missing the other pieces. Um, the code to call this uh, is present, and this could be something that is exploitable. So this one we would probably want to fix. Okay, so we're gonna run Trivi on the Cube API server 129.0 image, and we can see uh, most Kubernetes images are gonna have two Go binaries in them. One is Go Runner, and then the actual component that's gonna get, get run. Go Runner is the entry point, and it's gonna invoke and handle logging, and, those good things, here we can see there are 12, uh, one critical in Goner, and one critical, um, 13 medium, a few others, 18 total in Cube API server. So how many of those are actually present in the code path and how many of them would be excluded by providing a VEX statement? So we run it again and uh, same image and we're gonna pass uh, this extra command line argument VEX with uh, the JSON file that's generated for that. And we can see now that it's nine and 12. So we went from 12 and 18 to nine and 12. So that's kind of cool. I think um, it's good to share some of that information. Obviously, there's better things we could do and make, you know, clean this up and actually fix them in later releases and we would probably do that. But this doesn't show you what was excluded. You might want to know that as well. So Trivi's pretty cool about that and we'll show you which ones were suppressed. And it'll tell you exactly why it was suppressed and which source of truth kind of provided that. So that's, a, I think, a really useful thing that we could start to produce. It's another artifact. We need to figure out how to get that into the workflow so that you know, it's not me sitting at my laptop generating this with Go Volncheck. We do have that as part of some pre-submits. It's not doing anything with the, the data quite yet. It's just a check. Um, and a few other things we need to figure out about that, again, are obviously the how we tie that to the, the the image that's gonna be scanned. How do we distribute them? Uh, I think there's a, a VEX hub that's in the works. Some projects are putting them into um, GitHub themselves. Uh, you could also use OCI art artifacts to attach them. Lots of different ways, so we need to figure out some of that, some mechanics for that, but uh, definitely I think will be cool stuff that we can do to help the community out. All right, um, so just to conclude, uh, if there's anything you get out of this talk is please, please, please <laughs> um, talk to us privately so we can fix them ahead of time before it's disclosed publicly. And these are the great places where you can get a hold of us. And some other takeaways, uh, you know, things like uh, vendors. If you are shipping your own binaries, um, you should definitely look into uh, creating your, your own OS packages, creating your own container images. Uh, also, don't pull from 
random third-party registries. Um, but also, um, you know, publish your own CV data or your own VEX documents that actually tells your users, here were the things that got patched, right? And here were the things that are uh, false positives or, or whatnot, right? Those are, again, really great things for your customers. Um, and then also give feedback, right? Uh, and I think we have a survey, right, yep. um, that you can fill out and tell us how we as a community can help improve the discovery and patching a mechanism, a, a process for how we can improve uh, in the CVE discovery and uh, disclosure uh, uh, of the CVEs. With that, thank you. Thanks. Do we have time for questions or are we? Yeah, okay. If anybody has any questions, I think there's some. Mics in the back, and if you don't want to ask on the on the mics, oh, we'll hang out to the side for a few minutes, and you can come chat with us there. And please keep your cluster upgraded. <laughs> Oh, different link? The survey, oh, I, I didn't update the survey. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we'll get that done yeah, later. I will update yeah. it, so just keep the, uh, yeah. keep the link. But also, um, uh, let me, I, I think, oh, sorry, you were taking a picture, I'm sorry. You, you got it, okay. Yeah. But also, we're on the Kubernetes Slack. Um, wow, it's so hard to get back there. And those are, that's how you can get a hold of us. Um, even if we can't answer a question, we'll try to talk, get someone who can help. Um, but also that's another good way to um, give us feedback. Yeah, I'll, and I'll totally update the survey today after this, forgot about it. Wonderful talk. Um, I'm wondering if you can tell us how if people want to get involved with SIG security, SIG release, um, possibly even SRC, uh, where are the best places for people to get involved? I think the, the best place is probably to start with the community meetings for each of those projects. And you can find information about the SIGs in the Kubernetes community repo, so github.com slash Kubernetes slash community. You'll be able to find a readme or markdown file for each of the SIGs. It'll have meeting time and mailing lists. Um, the Slack channels are also a really great place to come and ask questions. And specifically for SRC, it's actually a nominated process uh, where usually someone on the SRC will nominate people. Um, and usually we'll look at you know, the type of experience this person's had. Um, and, and basically, uh, I, I think there's like a voting process. Uh, and, uh, and again, uh, I think even, even if you're not in the SRC, I think there are plenty of things that we, can, we really need help with. Um, so definitely, again, happy to help uh, connect the dots.